Now we know the categories that we'll be working in, it's time to talk about the specific elements that can rule a product in or out in our research process. We call these our item specifics to avoid. Let's dive in and list them out for you. You may wonder why I avoid some of these types of items, as they may seem on the surface like items that wouldn't pose us a particular problem. The answer to this is simple. Many items may be sellable, they just don't fit our particular system and our way of doing things. Other things may be sold and fulfilled by Amazon themselves, but the rules they have for us as sellers using their FBA system aren't the same. This is why we must always implement the specifics to avoid, or you may find yourself selling something that Amazon can sell, but you can't. Again, I've been there before, so this comes from experience. There are 15 item specifics to avoid that you can see on screen right now. As you're researching, you'll have this list in front of you on the product research spreadsheet at all times, and we'll analyze whether or not the item you're researching has any of these specifics present. If it does, we certainly disregard the product and move on. I'll now explain each of these for you so you have complete clarity on what they all mean. Let's begin with electrical or battery powered items. Here are the simple rules to live by. If it's got a plug, disregard immediately. If it's powered by a battery, disregard. Even if it's powered by solar, disregard it and move on. Finally, we can sum this up by saying that any items that require electrical power only result in complications and fault rates and should be thrown out of your product process immediately. Next, we have products that contain hazardous or chemical materials. I'm sure you'll agree that this one pretty much goes without saying as hazardous products are unfulfillable by Amazon. Now they do sell these types of products themselves, but as I've already discussed, the rules can and do change for us as sellers on the platform. Next, liquids, gels and powders should all be disregarded as again, they throw up too many issues and they're unfulfillable. You should also disregard anything relating to gas or aerosol type products. Pretty self-explanatory so far, I'm sure you'll agree. We also disregard products that are prohibited. By prohibited, we mean any pornographic and sensuality products. Any product that will affect the intellectual privacy of an individual, plant and animal parts, tobacco products including e-cigarettes and alcohol, weapons, fireworks and medicines. Again, pretty much common sense so far. Next, we have multi-box products. An item is considered to be multi-boxed if the item is delivered in more than one box. Generally, these types of products are very large and heavy. This is why they must come in more than one box and in many cases, they require more than one person to deliver the product due to its weight. A good example would be a kitchen table with four chairs. This would never come in one box. It may be difficult to know immediately if an item is multi-boxed, but best advice is to look out for items that are large and have multiple large parts. We must avoid these completely. Non-packable products are the next on our item specifics to avoid list. Essentially, anything that is an odd shape is something that we consider to be difficult to package up. If a box was put around it, then it would contain a lot of air, meaning that the box would have to be large to be able to house the entire product. Remember, we're going to be paying for the space our item takes up when we're importing our product and when we're storing them at Amazon. Therefore, we always want to reduce these types of products. An example here would be a lampshade that's individually packed. These products would generally be stacked on top of one another as they are difficult to box. We can't and don't want to sell stacked items. And so we consider this an unpackable or non-packable item. Look out for odd shapes that are large and disregard these items. The next one is pretty much self-explanatory, so I'll keep it short. Any item that's easy to break, disregard it immediately as it's a fragile item. Good examples are glass and porcelain. These types of items will travel poorly, generally speaking, and will result in higher fault rates and breakages as they must travel initially from your supplier to your place of selling then to the Amazon fulfillment centers, and then on to the end consumer via a courier or postal service. At any one of these points, these fragile items can break. If a product contains lots of small, fragile parts that can easily break, then you want to disregard those too, or you'll end up having to send out individual parts to buyers who receive broken items. Now we move into moving parts. Anything that's mechanized or involves moving parts to make a product work, you'll want to disregard. These items typically contain cogs and intricate parts that when broken will render an item unusable. Disregard these quickly. If an item requires significant construction, disregard. 
If operation of the product requires parts to move, or if any broken part of the product would stop it from working, disregard. A good example would be a coffee grinder. If the longest side of a packaged product is more than one meter in length, then you'll disregard it, as Amazon won't fulfill the item. Not only that, but you won't be able to get the product into an Amazon fulfillment center, as it's too long for couriers to transport into Amazon. Again, you may see Amazon selling these items. That's fine for them, but not for you. Other times, these types of items will be merchant fulfilled, meaning a third party seller is using their own courier to ship the item to the end consumer. That is, they're not using Amazon to deliver the item. Generally, it's quite unusual to see these as they're more typical of an offline purchase. A good example is a large projector screen. This one is very simple indeed, but must be mentioned and monitored when researching. If your item is too heavy for FBA, then you can't sell it. The heaviest box that can be sent into Amazon is 50 pounds. If your item is heavier than that, on its own, it will be very difficult to get it into FBA. Again, you may see Amazon fulfilling these items. Other times, there might be uh, merchant fulfilled. A good example is a home weight training set. These types of products can be hundreds of pounds or kilograms in weight and are very difficult to ship. Avoid these products. So we have difficult product operation. Basically, if the item is complicated to use or set up, then you should disregard it. Why? Because it's gonna result in plenty of customer service issues and customer questions that you simply don't wanna deal with if you're gonna run a lifestyle business. The easiest litmus test for these types of products is to ask whether or not it's possible to know how to use the product in less than five seconds. If not, avoid. Watch out for products that have a knack to using them as well. Remember, we're looking for products that are simple and dull and boring. We don't want items that are gonna take on an instruction manual or video to understand how to use it. The next specific to avoid is very easy to spot. We always want to avoid selling items under $7 or five pounds sterling. The reason is simple. It's too expensive for us to make an adequate profit because Amazon's fixed fees make low prices difficult to succeed with. Also, there's no margin for error in your pricing. And when you're selling something that is this inexpensive, you're at the mercy of Amazon if they choose to increase their fees, potentially turning something that was tight to something that may cost you money to sell. Not only that, but you must sell considerable numbers to reach your personal and business income targets. You've got to sell a lot of $7 items to make $1,000 per month from, from a product. In fact, you'd need to sell nearly $500 per month. That's a lot of stock to control and manage. I mean, if you were selling $500 a month, then you'd need to order 1,500 units every time just to maintain your item. This throws up complications in terms of stock management and investment. You also have less options available to in this price range due to seller competition. You see, it's easier to get started with what the so-called gurus call small light items. This is what every one of their students is doing. These items typically carry with them a lower price tag. Therefore, competition is intense. Keep away from this price tag and focus on items that sell for between $7 and $30. Next is safety. If the failure of a product would harm an individual or property in a considerable way, then disregard it and don't ever get involved in selling them. Two good examples that spring to mind are climbing ropes and climbing carabiners. If either of these were to fail when a climber was scaling a mountain, the consequences would be unthinkable. So we have replacement parts. Here we're talking about you selling an item that's a replacement part for an already established item. In other words, it's a generic lower price substitute for a branded item that requires regular replacing. The most perfect example is a laser printer toner. Now it might seem like a sensible thing to get involved in, as there will be plenty of demand, but you've got to consider that if the product changes or discontinues, then your item will no longer sell. You've also got no control over what these companies do with their products, as the parent company feeds the demand. They're the ones that keep the item in stock and selling. These parasite host relationships are difficult to profit from in the long term. Finally, you may also have legal issues surrounding the ability to be able to advertise your item as a part of the parent product. It's easier to avoid these items as we have so, so many other opportunities available. Next, we have items that are hard to understand. We employ the five second rule here, which means that we must understand what the item is and what it does within five seconds. If we don't, we avoid it. You see, you really don't wanna sell blindly when you're importing a product. I'm not saying that you must use it and be a customer of the item yourself, but you must, must know what it is and what it does and how it works. If you don't, then you're gonna find it very difficult to explain to a factory or sourcing agent what you're looking for when you're sourcing the item. Finally, we have IP infringement. If your item is related to established brands in any way, or taking an established brand or image and using it, then you're likely to go 
and fall foul of IP infringement. Using other companies' copyrighted material is a big no-no in this world. Large companies will protect their IP rights very aggressively and will result in you getting policy violations when you sell on Amazon. It's easier to avoid this instead and move on. Some products have a design patent and others have what we call a functional patent. These are legal protections which enable that product to, to be the only item using that particular design or that particular functionality of operation. You may see other companies selling their own versions of something that's patented. Let me tell you, it's only a matter of time before they're brought down. Good examples to get this into your mind would be if you saw a seller selling their own version of a D Disney lunchbox with Disney characters printed on the box. Another good example would be if you were to sell items that use Velcro. You won't be able to mention the word Velcro in your listing as it's a copyrighted uh, term. The same would be for Hoover items. You'd have to say vacuum cleaner. So here's the complete list. Have this at your side when researching and refer as you work through the process.